Hello. My name is Rebecca Bryant, Senior Program Officer at OCLC Research. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Policy Realities in Research Data Management. Works in Progress is a webinar series and a venue for both those of us who work in OCLC Research and also those at OCLC Research Library Partnership Institutions. The webinar, this webinar is an opportunity to extend and share investigations underway here at OCLC Research. This year, Brian Lavoy, Constance Malpas, and myself have been exploring how research universities are addressing the challenge of managing research data throughout the research life cycle, with particular focus on understanding the incentives for RDN services, how institutions are scoping their service provisions, and ultimately how they also source and scale these services. To conduct this research, we conducted interviews with four research universities, the University of Edinburgh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Monash University, and Fakenhagen University and, Re University and Research. And we have developed a model for exploring and understanding RDM service categories by distilling services into three broad categories, education, expertise, and curation services to help us compare and understand the services being offered by research universities. Our first report outlining this model and our research method methodology is available at oc.lc backslash rdm, and I'll add that to the chat window in a minute. Additional reports will follow later this year. In this webinar, we will be hearing directly from two of the institutions we are highlighting in this series of research reports, focusing particularly on policy development issues. But before we get started, I have a couple of meeting logistics to cover. To eliminate background noise and make it easier to hear the presenters, you are in listening only mode during the presentation. If you have any problems throughout the webinar, please submit a chat message to OCL Research, that's the host, and we'll do all that, our best to assist you. Our speakers will deliver their presentations, and then we will have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. However, we urge you to submit questions as we go along using the chat functionality. And I'd like to invite everyone attending today to practice using the chat now and to introduce yourself virtually. Just say something short, sharing your institution and why you're interested in this webinar topic. You might also feel free to share a URL or description of what you're doing locally or discussions taking place about research data management at your institution. We're all interested in this topic and it may help you all to connect with others uh, for sharing, and et cetera, during and after. So when using the chat functionality, please be sure to change the send to option to all participants, not just all attendees. We want it to be all participants before clicking send. So that, that way the presenters can also see your question. On a final note, we are recording this webinar. We will be making the recording available online afterwards, as well as the slides so you'll have the opportunity to watch it again and share with others. So with those housekeeping details addressed, I'm delighted to welcome Heidi Imker, Director of the Research Data Service at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, along with Jacqueline Wingersma, Head of Digital Production Center at Bakkenhagen University in Research, who will share about different elements of RDM policy development at their respective universities. So now we turn it over to Heidi. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm delighted to be here, and um, thank you for everybody for tuning in and um, being interested in this topic. Um, can everybody see my slides okay? We're good? Hopefully. Yes. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking today about the policies that we've developed for the Illinois Data Bank. So these are specifically policies that were related to our data repository. Okay, so their scope is, is, is a bit narrow in that, in that aspect. But just one quick slide then on the Illinois Data Bank. So we developed this recently as a self-service publishing platform in order to centralize and perver, perver, perverse, per, uh, preserve and provide persistent, reliable access to research data at the University of Illinois. 
Um, just a few words about it. It's a custom web application. It's not based on DSpace or some of the other repository technologies. Um, and it interacts directly with our preservation system that supports all of the digital content at our library. Um, we consider it a sibling repository to our IR, our longstanding IR, um, which we also call our document repository, which is IDEALS. Um, and we, um, the overall development of the Illinois Data Bank is described um, in a paper called Overly Honest Data, Data Repository Development, which was in Code for Lib um, last year, if you're, if you're really interested in, in reading more about it. So the policies are, um, most current policies are always live on the Illinois Data Bank website um, at databank.illinois.edu slash policies. Um, and then we have the previous versions of the policies are all archived actually in IDEALS. Um, but we have an access and use policy, an accession policy, a deposit agreement preservation policy, a preservation review, revision, retention, discussion, and withdrawal procedure. And then we have two additional guidelines that aren't policies per se, but they are um, guideline documents that help us um, make decisions. And those are withdrawal guidelines and a preservation review guideline. And I'll talk about that last one um, at the very end um, particularly. So policies, policy policies, why do we care about this at all? So at one point during this process, um, uh, Lee Stunham, who is a data curator with the RDS and I were having a meeting and it was um, some tedious aspect that was a little bit frustrating, I, I think for us, I don't remember the exact context, but I finally just said, geez, why can't I just make all the decisions? And Elisa said something that's probably the, the most favorite thing Elisa's ever said to me, which was, um, well, because you're not a dictator, so you don't get to just make all the decisions. <laughs> so, and that's true, we don't, we don't work in a dictatorship here at the University of Illinois or in the library. Um, so that's one reason, but the other reasons are, um, you know, really consistency as staff turns over. So Elise herself has left on to a, a new position at, at ENOR. Um, so you, we, but you want to be able to share that, that you're giving the same service year after year, even as, as staff um, does, does move on. Um, also depersonalization, so people don't always agree with this, the decisions that are made in terms of having a repository. So this is one way to um, make it less personal. So it's, it's not that I, Heidi, made this decision or the dean of the library made this decision or even the vice chancellor or researched it, it's, it's really our policies are, are what dictates this. And then um, finally, really clarity and transparency. We owe it to our researchers for them to know um, what we are saying and what we are committing to and how this repository works. And the same, you know, really in terms of transparency, you know, we're asking researchers to be more transparent and um, open with their research. And, you know, we really should be doing the same, same ourselves. So that was one of our motivations um, as well. So the proposed timeline for developing these policies um, really was in step with the development of the data repository itself. So we had about a year to de technically develop the, the data repository um, starting in August, um, so a, a basically a, an academic year um, with some very high level mi milestones that we had set out um, you know, every few months. And we did then, we also included the policy development as part of that development timeline. So right along with technical development, we were thinking about policy development. And I'd like to say that was some brilliant move on my part that I just knew that actually in the end, this was just how it was going to go and, um, or, and that it would be really useful to, there would be an interplay between the policies and the technical development. But honestly, I just knew that it was gonna take a long time to do the policies. So I, I tried to put milestones in to keep us on track. Um, and in the end, that ended up being um, a really fortuitous thing. So some details on, on how the process actually worked for creating these various policies. So first we created draft policies largely based on existing policies. So we already had um, pretty robust policies in IDEALS, the, the IR, um, and we didn't want to have policies that veered wildly for our researchers on campus between the two different repositories. We wanted them to be as similar as possible and only vary when necessary. Um, and so that was our first starting point, but then we also looked at other data specific repositories um, in terms of what their policies were. So some other uh, data repositories at institutions like Minnesota's Drum and also some, um, um, also some disciplinary repositories like ICPSR um, or the Roper Center as well. So we wanted to start with um, a, a good solid foundation for existing policies. We then identified a group of campus representatives for an Illinois Data Bank Policy Review Group, and this list was vetted then by library administration and our um, office for the Vice Chancellor of Research. So making sure that we were gonna have the feed that, feedback that we needed from across campus um, in different various areas so that we had um, a really well vetted um, set of policies in the very end, and we wouldn't get blindsided in a year or two when suddenly the ethics officer would, would have a question or the grad college would have a question. 
So uh, along with Elise and I, there ended up being 14 other people who were part of this review group, um, including, you know, a security officer, um, the director of sponsored programs, or, you know, the IRB, uh, grad college, like I mentioned, um, tech, tech transfers. So a really a pretty wide variety of people were included in this, um, in this group. So after, um, after we had, or while we were really um, identifying this group, we also had um, a representative from our campus legal department. And we touched base with that person uh, immediately and gave them a, re a preview basically of the draft, draft policies for basically draft feedback. So I was more or less trying to stack the deck with what I was thinking would probably be um, the person who would really, you know, critique the, the policies um, most uh, heavily um, and probably with the finest tooth comb, and that really ended up to be true as well. So um, I wanted to start um, by getting that um, uh, underway immediately. So then we assembled the policy review group for an orientation meeting, um, and this meeting was really important because in this meeting then I described what the Illinois Data Bank was, why the campus needed it, what, it, what purpose it would serve for researchers and the university itself, and it was also a way for me to set out what the process was going to be for developing and um, e evaluating and then finally approving these policies um, and what the people's individual in the, what these people's individual role was within, um, within this policy review group. Uh, at that meeting, I gave every member a copy of the draft policies then, and they had one, one month to review the policies and provide feedback prior to the subsequent meeting. So the idea was is that um, they would get a draft, they would give feedback, um, we would meet, and then we would repeat the cycle as many times as needed in order to um, come up with policies that everybody was, um, was comfortable with then. So, oops, too many. So an important part of this, and I can't, oh, there we go, um, is that I, at least I incorporated any minor feedback, like typos, you know, minor tweaks in wording, into revised drafts um, without the group. So we would, we would go through all the feedback, we'd go, okay, we can do this, we can do this. And then we selected only major feedback items for the group discussions at these meetings. And that was because a lot of these people are, you know, really quite high level, they have, um, They've been at the university for many years, if not case some cases, many decades. So the way I would look at these meetings is, I have you know over a million dollars and a hundred years of expertise in this room. I really don't want to talk about commas, or if I'm going to talk about commas, I want to make sure that's a really important comma. So um, I think that was a really important part of this process is to try and focus where our conversations were going to be and, and to really use that group to t discuss the meatiest, the meatiest, the meatiest issues. We ended up doing this um, repeat uh, review and meet process a total of three times. Um, so uh, that was a reasonable amount of time in the spring. And then we presented the finalized policies to our library administration and our office for the vice chancellor of research for the final um, review or final approval, I should say. So how did this actually map? So, you know, we had these milestones. Well, you know, did that really map? Well, the good news is, is that the beginning and the end were the same. We were able to, to um, launch the data repository on time. The details in the middle did change a little bit in terms of, you know, initially I was thinking we'd only meet with them once, but then this um, kind of iterative review seemed to be make more sense, and so we were able to do that in fairly short order. Um, so ultimately, we were able to get them done on time. And now, kind of in hindsight, this does seem kind of like a, a minor a minor miracle. So it is, can be hard to get these things done, um, particularly on what is a, a bit of a timeline for sure. So I spent some time thinking about, um, you know, why did this actually work, um, particularly for this presentation? So how did this work, and why did it work? And so these are some things that I, that I've thought of. Is we gave ourselves and others a fairly reasonable amount of time. So you know we had um, you know several months in order to to review the policies um, as a process. But then for each one of those reviews with this group, I gave them a month to review the process or review the draft policies. We also started with really solid drafts. So we didn't just you know walk into the room and say, hey, what policies do you think we should need? Or open up a Google Doc and let's start typing. You know, we we gave them um, pretty mature um, drafts to begin with. Um, and again, that had that kind of pre-legal uh, pre preview with the legal department. It was also supported by the OVCR and library administration. So when I reached out to people, I said, you know, our dean and our vice chancellor of research um, have asked you to be on this on this meet on this um, committee. We also, at that orientation process, I made it really clear that we didn't want to waste people's time. I hate having my time wasted. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, and we also made it clear that each one of their individual input was necessary, necessary important. They were an expert in a particular area, um, and we respected you know, their input, and we wanted to make sure um, 
that we had it because they were important to this process. And then we backed all that up by communicating really well and being very um, organized. So um, several people actually did uh, approach me or email me afterwards and just said, wow, this really worked well. And this was a very you know, functional group to be a part of and, and thank me for it. I think we were also fortunate in that there was a very clear deadline and a very clear goal in terms of no policies, no data repository. So I think um, having that sort of um, a carrot in, in front um, also helped kind of orient everybody uh, as well. Um, so have the policies been useful? So there's been a few indirect benefits, as I alluded to um, earlier, there's an ex unexpectedly huge benefit um, to developing the policies in concert with development of the repository itself. Um, and in hindsight, this makes utter sense, but it, it isn't how I approached it to begin with. But, you know, for example, we changed how the document, the um, deposit agreement was displayed for the better, and it, it works a lot more more functionally now um, the way the way it's displayed now. Um, and we had, we were, had the approval of this group in order to do it the way that we're doing it. Uh, it also really helped clarify our positions and, and processes for ourselves. So, you know, our developer has to hard code in, well, who can deposit a data set? That's really a policy question. So a lot of these things that were coming up in development were policy questions anyway. Um, so that was really useful for us to be doing in concert, again, with, with the development of the repository instead of after it's already been launched and quick, now we have to make these decisions. It's also a really great engagement opportunity for members of the review group. There was um, one person in particular who at that first orientation meeting sat in the back of the group and just gave me the stink eye the whole time and was really skeptical and kept asking me what the economic viability of this was gonna be. And I uh, was, you know, really, really not, not too on board. And by the end of it, he was a huge proponent and he viewed the policies actually as a really terrific educational opportunity um, for researchers on campus to explain, um, you know, about data and ownership and how, you know, how to store these things. And he, he really made an about face there. And so that was um, a surprising benefit as well. And we have actually had to use the policies um, after we announced um, in August, we had this soft launch over the summer and then we announced um, it for the campus in summer. We had someone uh, almost immediately contact us and want us to deposit data for another re or a researcher who's from another university but had used an um, Illinois resource, so a facility in order to create the data. Um, and this, universe, or this researcher at the other university um, is actually banned from that other university pending legal charges. And um, my very emotional gut reaction to that was, I don't want this person anywhere near associated with this data repository that we just built. Um, and that's an emotional decision, but we could actually point directly to the policies, meaning that at least one author has to be an Illinois author, um, creator of the data set period. So you know, it abstracts some of that um, personalization of it. It's also been useful in showing our dedication um, and professionalism and just our thoughtfulness. You know, we've clearly thought very, very hard about this repository, how it should work, how we're gonna run it. Um, it's definitely not um, something that we've taken taken lightly. And I think it's been convincing in, to show people that um, this is a serious endeavor that we um, will be taking on, or are taking on for many, many years. And it's also been useful in setting an example of transparency. Um, we do have some research projects on campus who end up building you know, a data warehouse or a data repository or database, public database. And um, it's helpful for pointing to them and say, well, you, you know, if you're going to be um, providing this sort of a service uh, you know, to your community, you should think about these sorts of things. What's gonna happen when um, you know, somebody wants to withdraw data that, they, that they've deposited, for example. So what's to come in the future? Uh, so we do have a policy review process that Elise was terrific in mapping out. In the first year, we did four reviews. Um, this fourth one is a little bit behind, uh, but we'll still get it in, I think, on time. So far, we've only had tweaks, so nothing major. That's, that's great news in terms of nothing was wildly askew in terms of um, how it's really had to work in practice. Those tweaks then have been, you know, typos or things like that, which are incredibly annoying to find, considering how many times we have gone through these policies at this point, but certainly better than um, finding major issues. And then there's really, uh, we really have testing. So um, what are these policies looking in the real world and are they matching with um, what our practices and um, how people expect the, the process to work? Um, so in particular, one thing that has been really unique for us is, um, or seems to be unique for us anyway, is our preservation policy. So we really tried to build in the flexibility for us to manage this data as a collection. And especially with the understanding that not all data may be of equal value or necessarily have the same enduring value. You know, some may be more, some may be, you know, less years. 
So we commit to retaining all the data sets for a minimum of five years, but then we give ourselves the latitude, the latitude specifically within the policies as well, to do a review of the data sets after that minimum five-year commitment. And in particular, we're thinking about extremes. So it could be that after five years, a data set has outlived its usefulness and should be considered as a candidate for deaccession. And how would that work and you know, what would that process look like? Um, but on the other hand, we also you know, may have data, and in fact, we, we do have data that has already been very highly accessed and used. It has a lot of relationships to other papers now. Um, so that data also warrants really periodic review to make sure there's nothing that we can or should do to ensure the data will be, remain um, equally as useful in subsequent years. So you know, another check on the formats, another check on the documentation, just another check. You know, we really want to steward that data as well since you know, our, our, our running um, um, belief is that we will have data that is highly valuable and we already have examples of that. So, but these sorts of reviews um, could be time intensive. Um, so we've been trying to devise a strategy to focus on what data sets really uh, need to be reviewed. And so that's something to come in the future is really for that data set to be, to be tested. So and I'll just give you an example of here how we've been thinking about it. Um, so this is our to be tested review strategy where we've been trying to think about, well, what metrics are we actually capturing within our preservation system and within the Illinois Data Bank um, to calculate this, an, an idea called a review indicator. Um, and this would be a function of downloads, relationships, um, a format scale, and then also the total bytes of the, of the data set. Where the idea is if you calculate this review indicator and it's really small, it might be that that, that that data set would be a candidate then for a manual review to look to see if, if it should be considered for deaccession. Where a really high um, review indicator would be, we should look at that, that data set because apparently it's really been downloaded a lot, has a lot of relationships, um, and it might be that we should look at it again to make sure the preservation is still, still adequate in order to make sure that it's going to continue to be much more useful in future years. So we actually described this in more detail in a poster at IPRES last year. Susan Braxton presented it for us um, called Should We Keep Everything Forever? Determining the Long-Term Value of Research Data, and it's available um, in the uh, IDEALS, our, our document repository. So, but this, you know, we have 50 data sets right now, and that's already too much that we, to, you know, it's not, as, not even a terribly large number of data sets, but we couldn't, you know, carefully review every last one of those. So, you know, our idea is that there'll be, the bulk of the data um, won't go undergo any review, um, but then we just look at these two extremes. But, you know, we're a year into this, we now have 50 data sets, we should really do a mock run of this review stra strategy and see how it works. You know, what's really useful, um, what's not useful at all, is this going to be remotely remotely um, feasible. So um, that's, if that's something that you're particularly interested in, um, or you know somebody who is, we are hiring. So as I mentioned, Elise has moved on to another position. Um, so go.illinois.edu um, slash joint RDS. We have positions available, and that's an example of something that I'd like us to be doing in the next year or two, is going through a, a mock evaluation of this process and to see how it works. So that's my last slide. Thank you so much for this opportunity and interest. I just want to call out um, Elise and Steve um, for all the great work they did on our policies here in the last year. And then also Beth and Sarah Shreves, um, who were really um, our trailblazers for um, the ideal, ideals policies really early on. So thank you again. Thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pass directly now to Jacqueline, who's going to be talking about what uh, policy developments at Wageningen, uh, and Jacqueline, can we hear you? Uh, yes, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So we'll, okay. yeah, we will um, turn it over to you, and then we'll have about uh, 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. Okay, so I would like to welcome you all, and thanks for OCLC to organizing this webinar. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Wingers. I work in Wageningen University and Research. I work in the library. And during my presentation, I will take you through the developments of our research data management policy and research data, some research data services from 2010 till present. I think I would like to stress that the main driver during the whole process of policy development was collaboration. I think you'll hear that word more in my presentation. So I will give you a brief introduction to my institution, Wageningen University and Research. I do this mainly for the participants from the USA. I think there are some participants from the Netherlands. I think they know Wageningen University. 
Uh, Wageningen is a small university town in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is a small country in Europe. So Wageningen University is in number of students, one of the smallest universities in the Netherlands. In total, there are 11 universities in the country, so we talk about small numbers. So I'm using the word small a lot. I would like you to remember that word. We like to think big, but we are small. And many of the choices that we made in the development of our RDM policy and services are based on the fact that we are small. So I said we are a small university, but we perform very well in national and international rankings. For 12 years in a row, students elected us the best university in the country. In the Time Higher Education World University rankings, we rank 65 out of 400. And in the Taiwan ranking, which ranks in the agricultural domain, we rank number one in the world. From the origin of our university was in the agricultural domain, so we are still very proud that we rank number one. So our campus is beautiful, and it's large, it's spacious, it's spacious, it's modern, and it's fresh. And we have had growing number of students for many years in a row, so much that we now have to start teaching in the evening hours. There are many international students and most MSc courses and part of our bachelor is in English. Our library is usually open until 11 p.m. and in weekends we are also open. So to close the introduction, we work in the domains of food, environment, plant, animal, and related social sciences. We like to call it the green domain. The institute has about 10,000 students and around 1,200 PhD students. Now, the institute also houses the National Research Institutes. They work in the same domain, but their research focuses more on practical research. They offer direct solutions for society. Their research orders come from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and also from commercial parties. Now, we as a library and also our RDM services, we like to cover both the university and the research institutes. So I told you we are small, but we love working together. This is where the collaboration comes in. First, at the university national level. I told you there are 11 universities. There is a, university, a union of all university libraries. We call it the UKB. Our directors meet once a month, and we find joint strategic themes, and we work on the collective. One of the working groups in this collaboration is a research data management working group, in which we exchange knowledge, and we work out joint services and new ideas. Second, there is a national coordination point for research data management. In this coordination point, there are about 80 experts in the data field from 11 universities, five academic medical centers, data providers, and professional education. And we all work together on RDM policy and service developments. And finally, there's a joint archive infrastructure which all academics may use, the National Data Archives. They, organ they also organize training for RDM officers from the library. Thus, a large network of peers comes into being. I think it is important here to mention that we in Wageningen University chose not to have our own infrastructure for data archiving, but to use the expertise of the joint national infrastructure. I'll come to this later. So I'm now entering into the development of our RDM policies and services. From the beginning, it was clear that the aim, the purpose of all RDM initiatives was transparent science. There were other arguments, like continuity of research and bring back into society what society has paid for. We call this the tax, the tax argument. But the main argument was transparency. This image represents the way we work on RDM policies and services de development. We engage with researchers. I think it is just to say that the library took the initiative for the first discussions on RDM. This was back in 2010. But we realized from the beginning that RDM policy cannot be made by the library, but it had to grow from within the research communities. In Wageningen, the graduate schools are the communities in which researchers and PhD students perform their research and find their peers. So from the beginning, we built up the relation between the library and these graduate schools to discuss RDM. So from our initial discussions with researchers in 2010, you see that there is a, a gap in our timeline. The next step we make in our RDM policy making is only in 2014. There is some interesting literature on RDM maturity models, but I will not address them. But they all state that RDM policy development is a step-by-step -step process. 
Now, also in the Netherlands, we were lucky that we got a small push from the research community. In one of our universities, there was a data scandal with a highly esteemed university professor who had his PhD students work with fake data. We called it lucky. It created a broad sense of awareness that RDM had to be taken seriously. In 2014, we had our first RDM policy in Wageningen University. Uh, the policy said that all PhD students and all university chairs should have an RDMP for from that date onward. An RDMP is a data management plan. Uh, you see that the scope was limited. The policy only touched the university and not the research institutes. And it also only touched the PhD students and it only prescribed a data management plan. In Wageningen, the graduate schools and the director opted for this rather lean policy from a certain philosophy. The idea was that when researchers thought about RDM and formalized it in a data management plan, that then good RDM practices would follow automatically. It was also felt that since academics have a rather anarchistic mind, and this is, by the way, what makes them good researchers, there should not be too much imposed on them. When the RDM policy was announced, the library was appointed to take the lead in developing services to support the researchers in RDM. Again, we realized that we could not do this alone. We are a small university, and this probably also means we are a small library. And RDM was a rather new subject for us and for our information specialists. So we started working on RDM services from a three-circle model with close collaboration with IT, our archive services, and our legal affairs. The data services we developed almost all find their roots in a request from a researcher or a research group. Of course, we work with front runners. Not all researchers were immediately eager to work with us on pilots. Even now, our data management support team consists of experts from the three circles. And we have enough expertise to cover the whole domain of RDM from the three phases that we distinguish. Before a project start, we provide data management plan assistance. During the research, we provide safe data storage environment. And after research, we provide archiving with, e with easy access rights. And where possible, we develop services on existing infrastructure and with existing providers, like our national data archive. I will give you an example. We did a data archiving pilot with DOMS. DOMS is our National Data Archive Institute, financed by our main scientific founder. DOMS provides an infrastructure on which research data is sustainably kept for the minimum required 10 years. I think this is different with Heidi. In the Netherlands, it's required that your research data are kept for 10 years. Uh, the DOMS also keeps the data longer if needed. DOMS provides persistent identifiers, DOIs, and they migrate to sustainable formats when needed. With DOMS, we developed a front office, back office model, where our own library staff is in contact with the researchers. They assist on the archiving process. But once the data is archived, it is no longer our job. DOMS is the back office, and they keep the data safe. They provide access. They migrate the files. By now, we have a similar model with another national archive and with the provider of the national research infrastructure. Our idea was, why develop this specific niche knowledge? It is better to build on, better, on bigger structures. And at the same time, we develop services which are open or can be copied by other universities, like our data management plan training or the use of our GitHub environment. Remember that I said that the services we developed originate from a request from the research community. There's one service which we developed for which this is not true. It did not originate from a research request. It is the registration of the data set in our, national, in our institutional repository. We took this initiative because we feel it is a good idea that Wageningen University and Research can show to the world in one clip, glimpse how many data sets are findable and accessible. Also, every individual researcher can show which data set he or she has archived. Since we chose not to work with our, with our own institutional repository for data, but allow data archive in the national archives and also in the main domain-specific archives, it is good to register all data sets in one place. 
So I'll tell you something about the recent development. Last year, our board of directors and the graduate schools asked the question, did it work? Does Wageningen now have a transparent data handling? Do we meet national requirements and do we meet scientific ethical standards? So we're now in the policy development history. We are now in 2016. In 2016, it re we, there was an evaluation of the RDM practices in the research community. And one of the conclusions was that indeed most PhD students and university chair groups now have a data management plan. The awareness of data management had grown to a maturity level. However, the policy also felt short on the fact that data management was not yet practiced in the research institutes, only in the universities. In the research institutes, no one made data management plans and there was hardly any data archiving. And it was also felt that the archiving of research data after research did not meet expectations. Many PhD students did not find their way to data archives, but some did, some through the intervention of the library and others in domain-specific archives. Additional RDM policy was required. So in 2016, the data management support team uh, was asked to advise our board on director on a more advanced policy. The new policy, on which I will brief you in one of the next slides, finds its origin in national frameworks, like the National Code of Conduct for Scientific Practices, in the FAIR principles, and in best practices in the organization. For the latter, we, we studied the RDM practices in eight use cases. We matched the use cases on the national frameworks and FAIR principles, and we translated the best practices to policies. And this is more or less what our circle of, of our work looked like. Uh, we took the criteria from the frameworks. Like I said, we took the criteria from the Code of Conduct of Scientific Practice and the archive law. We used informal frameworks like the FAIR principles, and our next step was the selection of the use cases, which re represented the diversity in our organization. We matched the practices of the use cases to the criteria deri derived from the national frameworks and the FAIR principles. And there, where we found a match between them, we used this match as a starting point for our new policy. Of course, we also found differences, which we discussed and overcame. The way we developed the new policy created awareness and goodwill since the policy is mostly based on practices found in the organization. So this is a very short summary of the new data storage and archiving policy. During researchers, researchers have, research, researchers have to store their data on in-house servers. We provide sharing facilities and safe access to the data. After research, all data underlying a publication must be archived in a trusted repository, which can be a repository from the National Archives, but it can also be a domain-specific archive. All data that are archived must be registered in our repository, just the record and the link. We will not create our own data archive within our organization. Most scientific domains already have trusted archives and researchers already use them. And secondly, we want to build, uh, uh, to use expertise built by others. Why create our own small infrastructure in you, instead of using what is already there? In short, what was good about the way we worked on the new policy? It created a lot of awareness. As we worked on the use cases, we got in touch with groups of researchers and their colleagues. The groups grew by itself and people offered to participate. The new policy, in fact, has little rules. It is built on what is already there, so it meets researchers' workflows and practices. And this then facilitates adoption. So I would like to thank you for listening, and I hope that you uh, enjoyed the presentation. I will give back the presenter button to Rebecca. OK, thanks, Jacqueline. All right, we have ample time now for questions. We're actually right on schedule, which is unprecedented. So if you have questions, we encourage you to put those in the chat window. Um, we had a few that came in. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with some questions for Heidi, but we have some for both speakers. Um, so the first one, Heidi, um, came from Amy Koshhofer at the University of Cincinnati, and she asks, did you try to recruit faculty researchers for your policy review group? No, Amy. 
Oops, sorry, I sound a little loud there. We we ended up not having faculty um, themselves. We would have ended up needing faculty from, you know, a breadth of, of disciplines all across campus, and that would have probably easily doubled the size of what was already a pretty large review group. Um, I will say, though, that so we've specifically included some um, uh, some subject specialists, namely um, Mary Schlembach, who is um, a subject specialist for chemistry, physics, astronomy, um, and also engineering, who interacts with faculty a lot as, as sort of a faculty voice in terms of, you know, what might they um, kind of find jarring or, or not jarring. And the same goes for um, John Towns, as somebody who is involved, who is a um, researcher at NCSA. So we, we did have um, some sort of faculty representation on the group, but we didn't uh, assemble a, a faculty group specifically. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Um, and a follow-up actually for Jacqueline, also actually from Amy, uh, and, um, it, and she asks, Jacqueline, if you can go into detail about how you built relationships with researchers. Uh, and I think part of what Amy's interested in teasing out is, is, is how best to do this uh, and if there, you know, what lessons learned we, we can all have for, for how you've built, done this successfully at Wakanagan. Okay, I can elaborate on that. Um, I think the key word here again is that we are small and uh, the library staff that we hire, sometimes they originate from the research groups themselves. So that is a starting point. Uh, I think uh, I think it's say that it's just to say that we know the front runners who work on research data management within the organization so we get in touch with them. Also, our relationship with the graduate schools is very important. Uh, the, the chairs, so the professors who chair the graduate schools, and also the secretary of the secret of the graduate schools, they are uh, in in close contact with uh, with PhD students and also with their with their professors. So that is how we make the liaison. We also have a specific liaison program from the library to the researcher. That's how we make the liaison between the library and the researcher. So it's really, Wageningen is a small village in which we kind of know each other, but we also cherish the relationships that we have with the graduate schools. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so Amy says she's working hard to build relationships with her grad school at UC yeah. Cincinnati as well. Heidi, do you have any follow-up for that? Um, with, with your own experience related to the graduate school or other important partners on the Illinois campus? Maybe they aren't the graduate school in your case. Yeah, we have had, um, a, you know, good relationships with the with the graduate school and that's, um, you know, we had somebody from the from there um, representing us on the policy review group. Um, and we, I mean, we really just try a scatter pro a scattershot approach. I mean, people are all over the place, decentralized like every other campus. And um, so we just try to be you know, everywhere all at once, which is a bit exhausting, but but um, that's sort of kind of what you need to do to try and get, get um, you know, a, a pin on everybody you need to get a pin on. Yeah. So. Also, Wageningen, we only have one campus, so the buildings, they're all very close to each other. Uh, people come to the building in which the library is housed, so I think maybe because we are small, it's a bit easier to liaise with the researchers. Probably more likely to run into them. Yes. Yeah. I guess that is true. So um, here for you, Heidi, here's a question from Brian LaVoy here with us at OCLC. Um, he asks, can you provide some examples of how feedback from the review group substantially changed the policies as they were originally drafted? Or did they? Yeah, you know, I would say that Overall, I think again because we had started with pretty good graphs and we had uh, drafts and we had um, good feedback from legal going in. Uh, I don't remember anything being wildly stark um, in terms of you know we did a 180 in, in some direction or anything. It was a lot of refining and, and clarifying things. I think that was one of the things that was really helpful um, through that group is the clarification of what we really meant within those policies and taking everything into consideration. One sort of major change that did come up was um, initially I had drafted a, a bunch of um, I had drafted a bunch of um, uh, definitions, but I, we didn't actually intend to initially 
um, release with the policies. They were just kind of for that review group and to, to help them think about things. And that became really apparent that those were um, necessary a component of the policies in, the, in and of themselves is, is having really clear de de definitions of what we even mean by data. Okay. Okay. okay, maybe I can also elaborate on how the use cases contributed to the Wageningen policy. In one of the use cases, there was a very strong belief that their domain-specific archive, the archive that they use, uh, was already a trusted archive, and th there was also a strong belief that it, it was only that archive that they were going to use for their data. So what we said is, okay, what we can do, we can see if the archive matches the criteria, and this way we allow uh, domain-specific archives into the policy. I think it's something that we should, would not have thought about if we had not had the use cases uh, that we were working on. Was that clear? Yes. Yeah. And so follow-up to that, uh, I think, uh, is from Hardy Schwamm. And he asks, um, how did you evaluate the RDM behaviors that helped to lead you, you know, to, to your decision process. And he's interested if you have an, uh, a methodology that you can share or have shared or if it's available publicly. Well, actually, it wasn't the library who did the evaluation in 2016. So it was uh, the evaluation was done by the board of directors. I think what they just did is they checked the number of archived data sets to the number of publications of the university, they checked in our repository how many publications had archived data sets uh, combined with them, and they found that actually that fell short to the expectation. So I think I'm not sure that we have the method of that evaluation. We do have the method of policy development, and we are writing a paper for Libra Quarterly on that currently. So that one will be available, I hope, soon. Okay, great. We'll all be watching for that. Um, Heidi, do you have any thoughts on that, about um, your understanding of researchers' behaviors in Illinois? Yeah, I was just thinking about that in terms of, um, you know, how do you evaluate? Uh, one of the numbers that I have, um, a rough number kind of stuck in the back of my mind, is we have something like 6,000 publications um, that are, can be attributed to our campus every year. <laughs> we don't have anywhere near 6,000 <laughs> data sets, right? Um, so, you know, not all of those publications may have data associated with them or would it be appropriate, or they might have a discipline repositories that we also love. And um, if there's a better place for the data, it should absolutely go there. Um, but there is, there is, we do have data on campus that, that doesn't have a, an appropriate repository. Um, so, so that's one way I've been thinking about it, and and by that measure, you know, we're falling way, way short in terms of, um, you know, archiving, archiving data and making it publicly available. Um, do I have, you know, like, do I end it just there? Going, yeah, well, there should be a lot more than there is. And I think it's an evolution. We come across people all the time who've never heard of the RDS, who've never heard of the Illinois Data Bank. You know, things are are picking up, but I think it does take a few years. I keep meaning to ask um, the ideals, the, our institutional repository people, if they have a, a graph, because I, I, my guess is that there's a leg in all of these things in terms of um, pick, pick upticks and, and the pickup of, of adapting policies. So, uh, but it'd be nice to lo know about how long that leg is, or is it, is it uh, you know, five years long? Is it 20 years long? Just even roughly, <laughs> how long can we expect uh, to, to be on the uptick? That was a bit rambly, sorry. Yeah, so um, I'm going to try, I have some follow-up questions for that, but I want to make sure we get to all the questions that uh, our attendees have asked. So a question <coughs> from Andrea Gobin uh, about how did you, Heidi, decide on the five-year retention? And then Jacqueline, I believe you also mentioned for the, the tenure in the Netherlands, if you two could quickly sort of address those questions. 
Sure, we settled on five because, and, and Abigail notes this too, is that there's there's not good there's not good guidance from a lot of the a lot of the agencies. The closest we had found was a reference on the Office of Research um, Ethics or Integrity. I can't remember if it's Ethics or Integrity from the Health and Human Services, which referenced an OMB circular saying three years um, after the last um, uh, report for the grant. So the, basically, the, the conclusion of the grant was submitted. So that's three years. Science, if you dig hard enough, the journal um, will say, uh, you know, complex databases need to be available for five years. You know, we looked around. I think it was Purdue that was committing to five, um, so there wasn't there wasn't a really clear number. Um, but we also had interviewed faculty on our campus, um, Christy Wiley, our engineering librarian, and for an engineering um, five years seemed to be about what they expected their lifetime of their data to do, to be in terms of before you know science would march on and they would be more interested in other things or there would be better methods. So we sort of just settled on five as a minimum, understanding that we might need to manipulate that and also just. You know, assuming, well, we may keep it longer, but we will commit to at least five, and that'll be our starting point. Um, so that's that's more or less, uh, you know, how we decided on that, but it's certainly debatable. Um, and overall, it's gone over fine. I mean, we have had a few people, particularly in um, the areas of maybe um, um, like our scientific surveys, so USGS, where they really they need to keep their data for for they will they intend to keep their data for centuries and already have you know kept it for a century. Where, but then you can just explain well this is how our policy works in terms of you know it's not that we plan to get rid of it we just want to be able to review it and um, here's the ways to make sure that it, it is actually going to be able to be um, you know usable in a hundred years. So, but they're they're more familiar with those things anyway. Yeah. So I think uh, my answer is a little bit more easy. It's the National Code of Conduct that prescribes a 10-year retention of the data. So that's what we also used. I think um, uh, our more urgent question is how to get the data in an archive. Is the, That question is more urgent than how long should we keep the data, I think. That's a uh, great point, yeah. <laughs> uh, we are far away from getting all the data into archives. So. We also discussed about the deletion policy or destruction policy, but we decided that we would not yet include that at this stage because it's more important to get the data than talk about what we're going to do with it with them in ten years' time. So one of the follow-up questions I had for the two of you was, you know, you you Illinois has its its local institutional capacity, uh, Jacqueline, you have national and sort of consortial level capacity for um, as for institutional data repositories. Um, but where are you finding your researchers are depositing things? Uh, and where are you actually encouraging them to deposit? What what is what is your sort of standard language on that as well? Uh, shall, shall I go first? I think sure. we are we are encouraging them to use domain specific archives if they exist, and uh, and then after that there are basically two tastes in the Netherlands, two choices. One is the DOMS archive, which is more for smaller data sets and data from the humanities, and there's the 4TU data archive, which is more for technical data. So it, I think there are not many options here. And for us, um, the difference between where do we recommend and where do they deposit? Where do they deposit? They deposit all over the place. Um, so we had somebody just ask about Dryad yesterday um, because their publisher wants them to publish in Dryad. We we try not to take any kind of um, um, territorialness. We just care that the data is somewhere secure and that it's available. So we have the Illinois Data Bank here as as a place. To, to make things available, particularly for larger size data. Um, so it's an option that is available to people. We don't hard sell it. Um, we don't hard sell it. Um, so they deposit all over the place. Um, in terms of what we recommend, we do the same. We always recommend a discipline repository if one exists. That's like data being with like data it means that it's going to be people are more likely to just you know even accidentally discover it or for it to be combined in ways that um, you know um, gives it more power. You know, for example, Gen Bank or, or any place like that. Um, Okay, thanks. Um, looking to see if there's any sort of follow-up questions with that. My guess actually, is that the let me, well, actually, let me, 
Uh, yeah, I was just going to add to And that's actually one thing, because we don't know where the future of this is going to be. I wish we had, you know, a nationalized infrastructure for, for data repositories. And in some sense, we do with some of the specific things, you know, again, like GenBank. Um, but, you know, we don't. And we don't know where this is going to go in five years. So that's one of the things that we did within our policies is, we, again, we gave ourselves the flexibility and the latitude where it says that, you know, um, upon review, we may transfer it to a different repository. So right now we have a, a bunch of great taxi data. And, you know, if it turns out in five years there's a fabulous transportation repository where that data really is, is better housed, then we want to be able to have the latitude to transfer it there. Um, so, and that's something else that we built into the policies. Okay. Uh, Heidi, do you foresee disciplinary involvement or advice in the future data review process? Yeah, yes, and actually that's that's one of the reasons why we really need to practice this or go through a mod version of it because it, it feels pretty heavy right now and um, particularly for any sort of um, deaccession, there would be a review group um, that would include a, a subject um, specialist. And also the first thing that we would do anyway is if, if we got there is we have the corresponding author information, we'd contact them and be like, hey, we're thinking about deaccessioning this you know, what's, what's your take? And if they, you know, are like, ah, it's fine, I, you know, no one's, no one's looked at that and no one's done anything with it for a number of years or, or they don't even apply or whatever, then um, that could help us. Or, if, but if they're like, oh, no, you know, we're, we're using that, I know people are, you know, et cetera, or, um, then, then we have their input as well. Yeah. What I also think is that disciplinary review of data sets at some point is going to exist because if, if you want to talk about incentives for data for researchers, you also need to talk about the quality of the data. And the assessment of the quality of the data can only only come from in within the scientific domains themselves, not from libraries or from research data services. For the two of you, what have been the most surprising parts of this process? And what advice would you have for those uh, listening today as they tackle difficult policy considerations for their own institutions uh, and, re and consortia? Wow. I think uh, the most surprising, I think it, uh, the most the most significant point in our in our policy is that we decided not to build our own infrastructure for data. And, uh, and to work with uh, with others, and I think <laughs> I really like that decision, uh, and and uh, it's based on collaboration and trust. So I I really like that decision. Uh, I, I, if, if if it is something that others could take with them, uh, I think it's that point. Thanks, Heidi. And for me, the most surprising, um, I I think maybe. I just I didn't expect um, the policies to be so comforting. <laughs> That's a weird word to use, but just because we put so much forethought into things ahead of time, it's just it's decisions that we don't have to make now on the fly. So I've actually found it to be um, very comforting and, and really give us a lot of security, particularly because you know they've been backed by by so many other people on campus. So I think that was a bit surprising. I just didn't didn't um, expect that necessarily. In terms of um, what I would recommend to other people is really to, to give yourself plenty of time. I think, you know, even us, it, it, it went well, we, we, we got it done, but if you noticed, it was only a few weeks ahead of time. So, so we were cutting it a, a little bit short. Um, so that would be that would be my other recommendation. Also, if you can just have the kind of people that we have involved, they were terrific. Um, Elise was very diligent and very um, detail oriented. So she was fabulous at it, and also our legal counsel was incredible. Um, so just the the way that they would review things, incredibly um, 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 detailed, uh, was was amazing. So. Um, so, you know, getting people who really um, are good at that kind of work um, and um, giving yourself enough time to let them do that, I think, is good advice. Okay. All right. Well, we are almost at the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank everyone who has attended, and I especially want to thank Heidi and Jacqueline for sharing about uh, their considerable uh, contributions the space of research data management. I particularly enjoy this opportunity to have sort of a compare and contrast between a, a U.S. research institution and a Dutch research institution. So I think that that's been, that's been very beneficial for me and I hope it has been for you. 
So as a reminder, this has been recorded and we will be sharing that. That will be available publicly and we encourage you to share and tweet um, uh, and so that others can benefit. Great, thank you so much. It was fun for me to participate and hear um, Jacqueline's work and uh, thank you for the great questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. That, uh, I wanted to say the same, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> great. It was a great opportunity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You. All right. Oh. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.